Hi. So today I want to talk about the origin of the elements and actually isotopes and the sun and the moon. First, I want to talk about binding energy and nuclear stability. So this is basically how are elements formed. And I'll talk about stellar fusion, stability of different elements and isotopes, cosmic abundances, and ultimately, why do we care about this? This explains why we see the most common elements in the Earth, and that is why we see the, the, the minerals, the common minerals that uh, we observe. The last part, I'll talk about the origin of the sun and the origin of the moon. So at the end of this lecture, I hope students are able to recognize and use isotope terms, understand the concept of binding energy, and be able to use that to predict the stability of different elements, and also to explain why we see the abundances of elements that we, that we do in the cosmos, as well as the abundances of the most common elements that we see in the Earth. And then also to explain relative distributions of elements on Earth from a knowledge of how the solar system and the Earth-Moon system have formed. So first, let's, let's deal with some terminology. So let's start with the chemical element, the symbol for an element. This is the element neon, so that's the chemical symbol for that element. In this notation, the lower left number here is the proton number, which, is, which we refer to as Z. Now there's some redundancy in saying neon and 10 because neon is atomic number 10, so if you look this up on a periodic table, you would see that the, it must have 10 protons. But this is to remind us that there are 10 protons in neon so that we don't have to go to a periodic table to look at this. The upper left hand uh, number is the sum of protons and neutrons. Uh, so there are 10 protons in this and it turns out there are 10 neutrons to so have a mass of 20. An isotope is a particular mass, so you can think of it as a species of an element. There's more than one isotope of neon. Neon 20 is the most common isotope, but there's also neon 22. The way that elements were formed is, if you go all the way back to the Big Bang, uh, the Big Bang fused elementary particles to form hydrogen, deuterium. Deuterium is hydrogen that has one proton and one neutron, so it has a mass of two. There's another isotope of hydrogen called tritium that it's radioactive. It has one proton and two neutrons. And it also formed uh, some helium when the temperature dropped below about a billion kelvins. When the temperature dropped to about 100 million kelvins, all matter was in the form of hydrogen, deuterium, and helium nuclei. Okay, so the nuclei are formed. Temperatures are so high, the electrons haven't actually bonded to it. So it takes another almost a half a million years for the universe to cool enough for atoms to, to form in the sense of e electrons bonding with nuclei. So the final product that you get is about 20% helium and about 80% hydrogen. Well, clearly we are here and we're not made of hydrogen and helium. So some other process has to have occurred to form all of the other elements that make up us and minerals and, and so on. To generate those nuclei that are heavier than helium-4 requires stellar fusion. So the way this works is that if you compress matter sufficiently and raise temperature high enough, then it will, then two atoms can fuse together to form another atom that has a heavier mass. So here's an example. If you take hydrogen one plus hydrogen one and you fuse them together, you can produce hydrogen two, that's deuterium, plus a positron. A positron has the same mass as an electron, but it has a positive charge. And a neutrino is a little subatomic particle. So that makes more deuterium. Okay, so now if you take deuterium plus hydrogen, you can fuse it to make helium. And a gamma, uh, gamma's uh, um, radiation is just energy. And then you can take helium-3 and helium-3 and you can fuse them together to make helium-4 and two hydrogens. Okay, so at this point, you're like, I started out with hydrogen and helium. I'm making hydrogen and helium. How is this getting me anywhere? Well, if you have sufficiently high uh, densities, mass concentrations, and temperatures, these helium-4s, which are not that common in the beginning of the universe, these helium-4s can fuse together and they can form, for example, carbon-12. So 4 plus 4, 4 plus 4 makes 12. The two pro protons in each of these adds up to make 6. And now you've got a new element. 
This element wasn't there at, after the Big Bang. This is something that has formed in a star as helium is fusing. Now, you can keep going on with this, and this is exactly what stars do. Carbon-12 can fuse with helium-4 to make oxygen-16. Oxygen-16 can fuse with helium-4 to make neon-20, which can fuse with helium-4 to make what's it going to be magnesium-28 and then silicon, or type magnesium-24 and then silicon-28, so on. All of these reactions generate energy, so the material is trying to collapse and it's, and it's fusing. That energy is preventing it from collapsing to a singularity, a pinpoint. That goes on until you hit iron 56. And it turns out that this fusion reaction, iron 56 plus a, plus a hydrogen particle to make iron 57, that actually takes energy. So after a star starts to produce iron 56, it's no longer able to create energy from fusion of iron 56, and eventually it will collapse. And that leads to a whole other series of reactions. So first of all, let's do a little review here. How many neutrons does iron 56 have? And the answer is 30. Remember, this number in the upper left is the sum of protons and neutrons. 26 is the atomic number, the number of protons. So if we subtract these two, we get 30. And 30 must be the number of neutrons. OK, so at this point, I hope you can um, understand and work with atomic and isotopic notation and terminology. We went through this very quickly. I, I, I get that. but. If you go back and review this and, and, and look at problems that you might have on a problem set or in a lab or something like that, then I, I hope that you can, you can work with these uh, terms. Okay, second, second major concept I want to talk about here is binding energy. So what happens when that star collapses? These big stars, when they collapse, produce a supernova. And that supernova it creates this big shock wave. It's an implosion with a, with a subsequent shock wave. And that shock wave blows off about 30 to 40 percent of the mass of the, of the original star. This creates this enormous neutron flux. And it's this neutron flux that creates almost, <laughs> essentially, all of the heavier elements above iron. And so here's, a, here's a, a thought experiment. This isn't actually what happens, but, but just imagine that if I took calcium-40, so 20 protons, uh, 20 neutrons, mass of 40, and I flexed it with 195 neutrons, okay? It'll actually help go through a whole series of, of elements as it increases mass. But let's just do it all at once. Ultimately, what this creates is a uranium-235 atom. How does this work? Well, of these 195 neutrons, 72 of these neutrons convert to 72 protons and 72 electrons. So the 72 protons, they increase the atomic number from 20 to 92. OK, 92 is the atomic number of uranium. And these 72 electrons stick to the atom that has those extra 72 protons to maintain charge balance. So now we have this uranium-235 isotope. Now, what does this mean? It, it actually, so remember that we have to add energy to create uranium-235. In fact, we have to add energy to create all of the isotopes, all of the elements above iron. What that means is that all of these isotopes are unstable with respect to iron-56 at some time scale. That time scale may not be physically realizable. My mineralogy instructor way back in the day told me that iron-54 has a half-life. It's not actually stable has a half-life of about 10 to the 50th years. OK, way, 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 way beyond the age of the universe. And so eventually, if we could go for you know, many, many, many ages of the universe, it would eventually form iron 56. And that's true for all of the isotopes. They should all be unstable with respect to iron 56. And eventually, they would spontaneously form iron 56. Now, this is not normal, right? I mean, this is way, way beyond the age of the universe. So one of the ways that we evaluate stability of isotopes, are they stable or are they unstable? Are they radioactive? Normally, these stability criteria can be assessed via something that we call the mass excess. 
And, and basically what this comes down to, where I'm going with all of this, is that radioactive isotopes have a positive mass excess. And it's this positive mass excess that converts to energy that is liberated during decay. Okay, so radioactive decay is a spontaneous process. It has to release energy. And the question here is, where does that energy come from? So let's take one radioactive decay, the radium, will radioactively decay to form radon plus an alpha particle. An alpha particle is a helium nucleus. And so we can express this in terms of isotopes. Radium-226 decays to form radon-222 plus helium plus energy. And where's that energy come from? Well, the mass of radium-226, that specific isotope of radium, not the element radium, but this one isotope of radium, is 226.025 AMU, atomic mass units. The mass of radi radium, <laughs> the mass of radon is 222.0175 AMU, and the mass of helium is 4.0026 AMU. And if you add these two numbers up together, you don't get this number. There's a mass excess. And that mass excess, the amount of mass that you have to add to this side of the equation to balance this mass is 0 0.005 AMU. OK? Remember Einstein? Remember the Einstein equation? E equals mc squared. Energy is equal to mass times the speed of light squared. So an excess mass here is equivalent to an excess energy, and that energy is released during radioactive decay. And so in this case, you can, uh, you can identify that radium is unstable with respect to radon and helium because you have to add mass here to make up the mass of the radium. Now, even at, that seems like 0.005 AMU, that, that's tiny, right? No, a little bit of mass excess is a lot of energy. And that's because of the Einstein equation here. That, that's because you're multiplying by the speed of light squared, which, of course, is a very big number. Let me back up for a second. An AMU, it's about the mass of a proton or a neutron, but it's a little bit less than that. The actual mass of a proton, <laughs> the last time I looked this up when I was putting together this lecture, is 1.00727646662 plus or minus 5. This plus or minus 5 is in the last decimal place here. So 62 plus or minus 5 AMU. A neutron is, one, is a little bit more massive, 1.00866491590. And the mass of an electron is 0 0.00548579990907. Now, how much energy is in 1 AMU? It may not seem like very much. If you take the speed of light squared times 1 AMU, commonly this is expressed in these sort of weird terms of mega electron volts. <clears throat> and in this case, 931.45 mega electron volts, maybe that seems like a large number. It turns out that if you convert it to joules, it's about 1.5 times 10 to the minus 10 joules. Not very much. but if you think about this in terms of molar quantities, so if we had a mole of neutrons or a mole of protons that we converted to energy, we would get 90 times 10 to the 12th joules. Okay, so that's a lot of energy. So on an atomic, on an atomic scale, it may not seem like very much, but when you think about it in terms of like real masses, moles and that kind of thing, it's a lot of energy. And so this particular reaction, we can figure this out, it produces 4.66 mega electron volts. And that means that this decay of radium to radon-226 to form radon-222 produces about 450 billion joules per mole. That's a lot. It's even more if it fissions. You can, of course, you can fission some isotopes. If it fissions, it would produce about what is that, 20 times 10 to the 18th joules. And put this in context, baking soda and vinegar, you know, you add vinegar to baking soda and it reacts, right? That's 15,000 joules per mole. And methane burning, right, this is how we power our society for the most part, uh, is 900,000 joules per mole. Okay, so these are, you know, hundreds of thousands, and here we're talking billions and billions and billions of, of joules per mole. 
So I just thought I'd plot this up, make this point. So here's baking soda vinegar. Here's our energy in joules per mole. Here's methane burning, okay? So it's way, way more effective than just a, a chemical reaction like an acid-base reaction, adding acid to sodium carbonate. Here's alpha decay. Okay, so these things don't even really register on the same plot. Alpha decay, this is what is powering the Mars probe, in fact. It's the alpha decay of plutonium. And then fissioning is like way up. Alpha actually shows up on this scale, right? These things are down at effectively zero. But fissioning processes, um, you know, nuclear reactors, that kind of thing, that produces a lot of energy. That's why people are interested in nuclear power is because it's an incredibly effective way to produce energy. So let's go, let's go back and let's not worry about how one atom relates to another in terms of mass deficit. Let's just think about a single isotope. So if we look at a single isotope, it has to have a mass deficit with respect to protons or neutrons or it wouldn't form. Okay, so here's an example of this. Here, here's helium-4. Helium-4 has two protons and two neutrons. The mass of helium-4 is 4.003. The mass of two protons and two neutrons, so if you go back and you look at the mass of a proton and a mass of a neutron, you know, out to 10 significant digits or whatever, you multiply each of those by two and add them up turns out to be 4.033 AMU, which means that helium has a mass deficit of 0.03 AMU. So in other words, to, to create this mass, you have to take out, you have to, you have to do something with that energy. And this is true for all isotopes. If you look at any, any isotope, even the radioactive ones, if you look at uranium-235, highly, highly fissionable, highly unstable isotope, you add up, what is it, 92 protons and however many neutrons that, that leaves behind you. Add them all up. They will be more than the mass of a uranium-235 isotope atom. What happens to this energy? This energy goes into, uh, it's called binding energy, and it's what holds the protons and neutrons together in the nucleus. In this particular case, 0.03 AMU, okay, that is equal time, if you multiply by the number of mega electron volts per AMU, that gives you 27 mega electron volts. And if you figure out, okay, on average, how many mega electron volts is that, how much energy is that, per nucleon, nucleon sum of protons and neutrons, divide by four, you get 7.3. Now, if you work through all of this and you sort of think about how this all works, what you will conclude is that atoms with larger binding energies are more stable. Okay, they have a lower energy. If you think of the protons and neutrons, you know, they're way up here, they have a high energy. On average, here's my helium, Okay, so that's got a lower energy. The binding energy has, has, is, is larger, there's a larger mass deficit. If I have isotopes that are lower still in terms of average energy, they must have a higher binding energy. There's a bigger step from protons and neutrons down to the, the isotope. We can plot this. Here is a plot of binding energy per nucleon. Here's helium-4, well, it's plotted as 7, 7.3. Uh, should be up here, mega electron volts per nucleon. And you can see deuterium, tritium, and helium-3 all have lower binding energies than helium-4. So these are unstable with respect to helium-4. And so these can fuse to create helium-4 and release energy. Binding energy increases all the way up to iron-56, and then it gradually decreases off in this direction. Here's U-235 up here, U-238, and so on. But it also depends on which isotope you're talking about. In, in this case, I was actually showing, you know, specific isotopes. Atoms have lots of different isotopes. Okay, so here's helium-4, here's helium-3. In, in this region, there's like a ton of different isotopes for whatever element this is. And there's one that is the most stable isotope, but there are others in here. They're less stable, more stable than the stuff down here, of course. But when we talk about binding energy, we really do have to be specific about which isotope we're talking about for an atom. So here's a question for you. What makes an isotope more stable?
And the answer here is it has a higher binding energy. Whether it undergoes alpha decay or not doesn't really say a lot about stability. Uh, well, if it undergoes alpha decay, it's usually less stable than some other decay product. The size of the atom really makes no difference. It's, it's all about binding energy. So now that we've gone through this, if you went back and reviewed, I would hope you would be able to explain how binding energy or mass excess defines isotope stability. So higher binding energy, larger mass excesses increase isotope stability. Predict the stability of an isotope relative to another based on binding energy. So that's like the radium to radon plus alpha particle. Which side of that reaction is, is the stable one? And you can assess this based on, on masses. And then basically describe element stability and, a, and abundance trends for, especially with respect to isotopes. So which isotopes are more stable, which are less stable? Again, looking at masses. So now I want to turn from atoms and isotopes, the nitty gritty of those nuclear reactions, to talk more about the origin of the sun, the earth, and the moon. So as I mentioned, the, the way that these systems begin is that you start with hydrogen and, and a little bit of helium, but mostly hydrogen. And this hydrogen condenses to form a star. This star first burns hydrogen to form helium. OK, so that's a, that's a fusion reaction. And the temperature is about a million degrees C, a million kelvins. After hydrogen, hydrogen is exhausted within the center of this star, the star gravitationally collapses. And as it collapses, it also heats. When the temperature reaches about 10 to the 8th degree C, 10 to the 8th Kelvin, helium burning starts. And so now we go through this reaction that helium, three heliums, fuse to form a carbon-12 atom. So after that helium is exhausted, in that core of the, of the star. Then the star collapses more, and we go to carbon burning. So carbon, uh, oops, this is backwards, isn't it? This, oh, no, this is right. So you take two carbon atoms, you fuse them, and they will form a neon atom plus an alpha particle. There are other reactions that can occur. You can form sodium-23 plus a proton. There are other reactions. Carbon-12 plus a helium can form an oxygen-16. I talked about that earlier. But basically, you're, you're starting to move your way up the periodic table. And so this burning continues until you get to iron 56. And then at that point, there's nothing to offset the gravitational collapse. And it's at that point that the star catastrophically implodes and this supernova occurs. The supernova produces a flux of neutrons. It also produces protons. But it's mostly neutron capture by iron and other elements to form the heavier elements. And so here's an example of what these things look like. So here is a small star, like our sun. The r naught is the radius of the sun. So this one is actually bigger than ours. And it has a little core, and it has a radiative envelope. But if you look at the core, there's a hydrogen burning shell, and there's a helium burning shell. OK, now if we go to a star that has 300 times the radius of the sun, Okay, so here's our core. There's the convective envelope. So this has a, it still has a hydrogen burning shell, has a helium burning shell, and it also has this carbon oxygen core. Okay, so this is where the helium is fusing to form carbon, and it also forms some oxygen. And then if we go to a very large star, these are the ones that implode to form supernovas then you have hydrogen burning, helium, carbon, neon, oxygen burning, silicon burning, and so on, until you get this, this inner iron core. And eventually, this star will, will collapse because it can't withstand the gravitational collapse. And so these are various reactions. You, you don't need to know these except to, um, I'm simply pointing out that as you move your way into the core of a star, the temperatures get higher and higher and higher, and you see reactions that involve higher and higher and higher atomic number elements. Now, if we look at the abundance of elements in the solar system, it has this distribution. Now, first, I want to say this is a log 10 abundance. So these are all normalized to silicon at 10 to the 6th. 
Okay, so this would be like 10 to the 6 moles of silicon. We'd have not quite 10 to the 11th moles of hydrogen. So five orders of magnitude more hydrogen than silicon. And really low abundances of beryllium, for example. So hydrogen and helium in the solar system are very, very high. These are anomalously low, but basically the abundances decrease with increasing atomic number, with increasing Z. Why is that? Well, it's because the efficiency of producing these heavier elements gets lower and lower and lower when stars form, right? So you have to have a neutron flux to create these elements, and it's more likely to create elements that are close to iron than farther away from iron. There's a really pronounced zigzag pattern here. This is called the Otto Harkins effect or the Otto Harkins rule. And this has to do with the stability of the even atomic numbers versus the odd atomic numbers. And we'll come back to that in a, in a problem set in this class. So a first generation star, these are the large stars that, that go through these, these supernova processes. They, they go through an entire cycle in a few million years. Pretty clearly, the, our sun is not a first generation star. If it were a first generation star, there would be no way to create any of these heavier elements down here. Nothing above hydrogen and helium, right? So what does that mean? That means that some other star had to die, had to go through a supernova to create the elements that went into our solar system to create our sun and our planets. So our sun is not a first generation star. The, the concept is that our part of the nebula, nebula is this gaseous cloud of, of particles, of atoms, was helped to contract by compression, by pressure wave, associated with a supernova. Now, maybe that seems like, really? That sounds like a shaggy dog story. How do we really know this? We can actually observe this. We can observe this in places like the, I think it's the Orion Nebula is a good example where you can see the shock wave of a former supernova compressing the gas in that, in that gaseous uh, cloud. When we think about what the most common elements are, let's go back to this for a second. If you look at the really high abundance elements, okay, hydrogen, helium, that's mostly in the sun. But if you look at these other elements, carbon, oxygen, neons and noble gas, but magnesium, silicon, aluminum, sodium, sulfur, those are the most abundant elements in the solar system because those are the most common products of stellar fusion. And so it's perhaps not surprising that these elements, iron and, and all these other ones here, are the ones that define the most common mineral groups. So for example, if we look at silicates, silicates are about 92% of Earth's crust. They are made up dominantly of silicon, aluminum, and oxygen. That's, felt, that's quartz. Feldspar has sodium and calcium. Pyroxenes and amphiboles have iron and magnesium and, and calcium. Micas have potassium, silicon, aluminum, and oxygen. So the abundance of these elements is why we see the silicates. Why do we have carbonates? Carbonates have carbon, it's fairly abundant, and almost all is in carbonates bonded with, with uh, oxygen. Phosphorus, we have a lot of phosphates. Phosphorus is pretty abundant. Almost all of that is in phosphates. We have lots of oxides and oxyhydroxides because there's lots of oxygen created by stellar fusion. And then the other most common minerals are sulfates, sulfides, or halides, and that's because sulfur and fluorine and chlorine are fairly abundant. So I'm gonna go back here again. Carbon, oxygen, fluorine's down here. Chlorine, where's chlorine? Chlorine's here, pretty high abundance. Phosphorus, potassium, calcium, sulfur, silicon, magnesium. That's why these minerals are, dominate the makeup of the Earth. So here's a question. Why do elements with low Z tend to be more abundant in the solar system? And the answer, the principal answer, the best answer is that High atomic number elements are made only during supernovas. 
It, it is true that higher atomic number elements, some of them can break down to form low atomic number elements, but some of these elements, you know, if you look at copper or silver or gold or zirconium, something like that, they're high atomic number elements, but they don't break down on universal time scales to form low Z elements. We don't have a first generation star, we wouldn't be here. And low Z elements, they do fuse more readily than, than higher atomic number elements, because that's how you form the higher atomic number elements from hydrogen all the way up to, uh, to iron. Okay, now I want to uh, switch out here. I want to show you last the formation of the moon and the differentiation of the Earth. And I think one of the, one of the best ways to see this is to look at an impactor simulation that a professor at the University of Rochester, Miki Nakajima, has put together. So what she's done is she's created these models where you have two bodies that impact each other. And each of the bodies is made up of a zillion little interacting particles. So they're held together by gravity, but they, they can interact with each other in a, in a physical way. Okay. So I'm going to jump to her. Here's her website. Oh, there's a picture of her. And if we go down here, simulations. Okay, we're going to play this video. The way this works is this is the proto-Earth. This is a Mars-size impactor. The gray here is the metallic core of the Earth. This is the metallic core of the Mars impactor. And you're looking at a cross-section through these. So this is essentially mostly mantle and core, mantle and core. And you'll see this Mars-size body impact the Earth with a, with a, in a glancing blow. And then you'll see how all of the mantle and core particles interact with each other. OK. okay. OK, so now I'm going to rerun this. I'm just going to comment here. OK, so that's the initial impact. Why is it a glancing blow? It's because the Earth is spinning. So we know there has to be some angular momentum imposed on this. And take a look at this. So now the Mars size impactor is being drawn out into a jet. It still has a little bit of a core here. And this is going to reform and come back and re-impact the Earth. And as it impacts, it gets pulled out into an even longer jet. But, but look at where the core is of this impactor. It's close to the Earth. And you can see all of this original core of the Mars size impactor is sinking down into the center of the Earth to, to form more core material. And then this stuff breaks up into little bodies that then get spread out into, into little jets. And so eventually what happens is the, the Earth, of course, consolidates. All of this metallic material sinks in to form the core. All of this material outside the Earth condenses to form the moon. Of course, the moon has a much smaller mass than the Earth. And if it, if it does have a core, it's a much smaller core. Why is the core of the moon so small? It's because almost all the core of the impactor went into the to form the core of the Earth. And so what does this mean? Well, this has major implications for the distribution of material between the Earth and the moon. So for example, we, we have an iron core. And most of that core is in the Earth. It's, it's not in the moon. It also has major implications for the distribution of the elements and consequently minerals in the Earth. So we have a core, a mantle, a crust and an atmosphere, and that's because of how the elements distribute themselves. 
after this impact occurs, the impact essentially melts the Earth. Okay, so the, the Earth, the surface of the Earth turns into a magma ocean. And so this degasses all of the, the gases, like the, the noble gases and, and uh, water. Those all go up to, f to form the atmosphere. The metals sink to form the core of the Earth, and then what's left over is, is the mantle. Okay, so at the end of this, I hope you are able to understand and work with atomic isotopic notation, be able to use the concept of binding energy for various useful purposes, and then generally to explain the origin and evolution of stars and our solar system and the moon. Right? Thanks.